Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A man walked into a gift store that sold religious items, and very near the cash register there was a display of crosses, and on each cross there were the letters WWJD. The man was puzzled about what these letters might mean, could not figure it out, and so he inquired of the clerk. The clerk said that the letters stood for what would Jesus do, and an effort to help people not make rash decisions, but instead consider what it might be that Jesus would do in precisely the same situation. The man thought about that for a minute, and he said to the clerk, well, I'm quite sure that Jesus would not pay $17.95 for one of these crosses. <laughs> Stuffed animals are a great toy for small children. One, one day, a girl named Sophia got a stuffed bear. Oh, she loved her stuffed bear. The eyes were plastic and had those little black discs inside. They would move to give the impression that the eyes were alive. One day, those discs got stuck in the eyes, and they got stuck right in the middle, so it looked like the animal was cross-eyed. It disturbed the mother. The mother told Sophia that they should go to the store and return the defective bear for a new one. Oh, no, said Sophia. I love my bear. I'm going to name him Gladly. Gladly, said the mother. That's a, an unusual name for a bear. She said, well, I, I, got the, I got the name from church. You got the name from church? The mother asked with a furrowed brow. Yes, yes, Sophia said. We, we, sang it. we sang it last Sunday. Gladly, the cross-eyed bear. Oh, thank you. It's gone a lot better this morning than last night. Today, the last day in which we will consider our large stained glass windows on the south wall of the sanctuary, we deal with crosses. There are only four obvious crosses in all of the symbols on that stained glass window. Now, I'm sure that if you squint and you look at obscure portions of the window, you could imagine some more crosses, but there are only four very obvious crosses. I would not want you to miss the biggest cross of all, however, and that is the cross that is right in the middle of the stained glass, a plaster cross that is outlined by the stained glass panels. It is no accident that it is the cross that holds up the stained glass. But of the four obvious crosses, two are at the very, very bottom, the last two images of the cross that we will deal with today. They are displayed for you. You can see on the left side a cross patty. It is green. And on the right side, you can see smack dab in the middle of Luther's rose, a black cross. We will come back to Luther's rose and instead spend some time now with the cross patty. Dominant in that image is the cross itself. And then in the middle, there's this red disc, which I'm sure looks odd to you, made even more odd by the metal bar that runs through the middle of the glass. It actually is the initials of Jesus in Greek. There's an I. Can you see that up, upper, uh, just the I? And then there's an X. Stands for Jesus Christos in Greek, right in the center. And the cross stands on a mound. Out of that mound grow two branches. We've seen branches before on the upper left of our window. From the foot of the cross flows from water down into a greater pool of water in which we can see fish. Now it is called a cross patty. There are scores, even hundreds of stylized crosses in the world. 
I'm sure that we have dozens of those styles right here today, crosses that you have worn to worship. This cross is called the cross patty because of its flared ends. Every end is bigger at the outside than it is in the middle. We see this first in Christian art in the 600s A.D. And then the Crusaders around the turn of the last millennium, the year 1000 or so, for a couple of hundred years, used this symbol frequently. And more ominously, in the last century, if you shorten that bottom part of the cross, you can perhaps see the iron cross that the Germans used in the world wars. The nation of Montenegro and its capital city use variations of the cross patty in their flags. And even the cross that I wear almost every Sunday is a stylized cross patty with the flared arms. But far more important than the style of cross is what the cross represents. Again, please note right in the middle the two initials of Jesus in red, Jesus Christos, centered on the cross. Standing on that mound, there are branches growing. What, what do branches mean? Here, the first two verses of the prophet Isaiah, the 11th chapter. A branch shall grow out of Jesse's stump. Out of his root, branches shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall be upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Do you think this one foretold of Isaiah is Jesus, the shoots, the branches? And why would water flow from a cross? Is that symbolic of our own baptism? Water flowing then down into this much larger pool of water where there are fish. Fish representative of the church. Are not water and fishing and discipleship commonplace in Jesus' teaching and ministry? There, there's just so much. So much in this what seems to be a simple picture that we can consider in our holy faith. But we need to move to Luther's rose. We can move to a next picture and see how this Luther's rose would have looked in our former sanctuary on the very north side of this building. This picture comes from one of the last weddings we did at Bethel in that sanctuary 11 to 12 years ago. If you will recall how this window was situated in the north sanctuary, much of it was obscured. That is, there was a huge balcony built across most of the window so that you could not see it unless you went up to stand by Dale Mundall and peered over the edge. However, every time you entered or exited that sanctuary, you could easily see Luther's rose because it was right at eye level. The stained glass representation of Luther's rose is not as detailed as Luther would have us consider. And so I have offered a picture of Luther's rose the way Luther would want us to see it. I would love you to study this picture, study its colors, study its symbolism, as I read to you Luther's own interpretation of his seal written in a letter on July 8th 1530, 485 years ago. Grace and peace from the Lord. As you desire to know whether my painted seal, which you sent to me, has hit the mark, I shall answer most amiably and tell you my original thoughts and reason about why my seal is a symbol of my theology. The first should be a black cross in a heart which retains its natural color, so that I myself would be reminded that faith in the crucified saves us. For the one who believes from the heart will be justified, we read in Romans 10. Although it is indeed a black cross, 
which mortifies and which should also cause pain, it leaves the heart in its natural color. It does not corrupt nature, that is, it does not kill but keeps alive. The just shall live by faith, from Romans 1, faith in the crucified. Such a heart should stand in the middle of a white rose to show that faith gives joy, comfort, and peace. In other words, it places the believer into a white, joyous rose. For this faith does not give peace and joy like the world gives. That's why the rose should be white and not red, for white is the color of spirits and of angels. Such a rose should stand in a sky-blue field, symbolizing that such joy in spirit and faith is the beginning of the heavenly future joy, which begins already, but is grasped in a hope not yet revealed. And around this blue field is a golden ring, symbolizing that such blessedness in heaven lasts forever and has no end. Such blessedness is exquisite beyond all joy and goods, just as, the jo as gold is the most valuable and precious and best metal. This is my summary of theology. I have wanted to show it to you in good friendship, hoping for your appreciation. May Christ, our beloved Lord, be with your spirit until the life hereafter. Amen. Is it amazing to read together words that are 485 years old? just by glancing at a symbol like this, can you see immediately all those things that Martin Luther draws into his own seal? It is a seal that we will see fairly frequently in churches and especially in Lutheran churches. Here is a, a needlepoint of the same seal that was done by one of my aunts for my father who was a pastor. And of course it has been bequeathed to me. Here is a quilted representation of the same which hangs in our church office. Luther puts a lot into a black cross, although this one is brown, into a red heart, into a white rose. Easy to see all of those things. You recognize all of those things. And you will recall that Luther bases his seal on the Christmas rose, which we dealt with three weeks ago. It is also in our window on the left side, about halfway up. But beyond the cross, the heart, and the rose, would you have ever thought about the blue being symbolic of the heavenly joy that is ours, that begins right now, but we hold in hope? in blue, and that surrounding it all is an endless ring. It's a circle, of course, an endless ring representative of the endless joys, riches that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, people forever have tried to represent their faith in art. Sometimes it has gone very badly. For instance, with the crafting of the golden calf during the time of Moses. Most of the time, however, our Christian art faithfully depicts our part of the journey on the way to these heavenly riches, giving praise to the God who gives us all good things. Very often that art can tell a compelling story of light and of life. So today, we end a story that is told to us through bits of colored glass. Next week, we begin a whole new chapter of our worship and our teaching as we engage in the story, the greatest story ever told. Amen. Please rise.